Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. In addition to being a most important advocate for affordable housing and sustainable development, my guest Brad Lander is the director of the Pratt Center for Community Development, a remarkable institution. So welcome. It's oh, a thank wonderful you so much. job. It is a wonderful job. I'm lucky to. to are you and you're a, a planner or an urban what? Uh, I, I teach in the urban planning department at Pratt, and I have degrees in planning and in uh, social anthropology. Oh, that's very good. So, but that's interesting because that does bring in a whole sense of community and the importance of it. That's right. That's right. I mean, community planners, not all planners, certainly not master planners, but community yeah. planners and anthropologists both believe that what folks in neighborhoods know, they have sort of the vision yeah. and local knowledge that you want to tap into as you try to shape and, a community. And that I mean, it's interesting because, you know, if you talk to someone in juvenile justice, uh, today was uh, the other day was domestic violence. All different kinds of projects, uh, child fel uh, foster care, child welfare. It all comes down. The new thinking is that it has to really be protected in the community. That's right. So that's really the basis of organizing these days for lots of reasons. Yeah, what right. does sustainable development mean? Well, obviously, it's a sort of a new field, an emerging field that means a lot of different things to to a lot of people. And the classic uh, definition is this idea of, you know, uh, how can we think about something that's sustainable for at least seven generations? You know, kind of using the resources of the planet of the city in a way that thinks past kind of our immediate needs. Uh, some people want to uh, blow it out much larger and not just make it about resources and, and the environment, but make it how do we build a sustainable city, which means ones that people can afford to live in and, you know, that is a healthy place to live in. Um, but one good thing you are seeing is that gradually the standards for at least building construction uh, are increasingly becoming ones that pay some attention to. Uh, whether the materials, or whether the energy is going to be used okay. efficiently, whether the materials are... The, the Pratt changed. Institute does what? It's part of Pratt... Uh, the, Pratt the Pratt Center is part of Pratt Institute. That's right. So Pratt so, Institute is a top. school it's of uh, art, design, architecture, library sciences right. in Brooklyn. We have a Manhattan uh, campus as yeah. well now. Uh, and then affiliated with mostly the planning department, which is in the School of Architecture, mostly planners and some architects as well. Now, more than 40 years ago, uh, a young professor named Ron Schiffman decided that a thing that planners at Pratt should be doing, and architects as well, was working with residents and communities to try to make a difference in those neighborhoods, to try to help neighborhood residents uh, connect with a broader dialogue about planning and development in their neighborhood in the city and give them some of the tools that they would need to make sure that their That's vision could shape development. And so we have a staff of 20 planners, architects, some real estate development folk, policy uh, professionals who uh, work with students and professors but work first and foremost with community organizations around the city on issues of affordable housing, land use, economic development, environmental justice. You were at, you were at one of those organizations, That's right? right. So I worked for 10 years at the Fifth Avenue Committee, a, a wonderful Which, community development group in Brooklyn that builds affordable housing, does job training, adult education, helps former prisoners come back to the neighborhood and make sure they have a chance to succeed, and does a lot of community organizing to try to make the neighborhood better found at a time when that neighborhood, even though today it's uh, Park Slope, <laughs> at the bad. time it had a whole lot of vacant buildings and vacant lots and people came together and said, we're going to make this place a great neighborhood, but we're also going to maintain its diversity, kind of keep it as a real place of opportunity. So uh, I had the good fortune to be the director there for 10 years and, and got a, a lot of help from the Pratt Center. I, it's how I got my master's degree. It's how I learned to develop affordable housing uh, through their training programs and some technical assistance. And so after doing the work at Fifth Avenue Committee thought it'd be wonderful to get to work with other groups around so the city. So the housing that you created there at, in the Fifth Avenue, um, is that still affordable? I mean, how, what kind of housing does that become? Absolutely. Well, so Fifth Avenue Committee, uh, in my time there, we created about 500 units of, of affordable housing. And really, f uh, of all kinds, we created housing for homeless people with special needs. Uh, we created cooperative housing, rental housing, uh, and some homeownership housing for people getting a first, uh, their first chance to buy. The, everything that we created is still affordable. Most of it is regulated so that when somebody, whatever your income is, you can stay. Uh, if you go up, and, yeah, you know, right. either it's rent regulated, so it just goes up a little bit a year. We always keep it, make sure it's below uh, thirty percent of somebody's household income, so they have enough right. left over to pay the bills. And then when that person moves out, the rent is sort of reset to be affordable for somebody do, earning. Do people money. move out or do they stay? Well, they certainly stay a lot. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's become a wonderful neighborhood. I mean, first, it's, people in New York City, if they have an affordable apartment, rarely move out right. uh, of anywhere. And then certainly in neighborhoods that have really improved, like Park Slope. 
people fight even harder to stay, stay in those there. neighborhoods. So but, that, you know, also people have it, kids and have to, you know. They, they, have, they don't have enough space. Grow, and, so. Wasn't, but, the, but were, were they younger people who were there? I don't know. Well, we did. We, we had uh, okay. one building, for example, that's all studios. That's for oh. homeless single adults <laughs> and low-income single adults. And a few of them have gotten married and had families, Great. and then they have to move. So not a lot of turnover. That but was some. one of the things with Mitchell Lama's, wasn't it, that didn't quite work out? I mean, wasn't Mitchell Lama originally envisioned as a, as a place for young people who would move on. Right. Well, and now Co-op City's become on. the largest naturally occurring retirement yeah, right. community in the world. <laughs> so interesting. Think, and on the West so Side, we have the same thing. That's right. So, but that's, that was one of the problems. I mean, it, it doesn't, there's, you can't move on and out because there's no place to move, right? That's right. So then you have to provide affordable housing. Then presumably as, as a family gets bigger and older, they may have more money. There's no place to move. That's a big problem in the city. It is, it is. And obviously there's some mismatch. You know, there are certainly people living in houses that they needed of that size when they had kids and now the kids have moved. And, and then they But I mean, you're not going to say to them, you have to, you have to move to a smaller unit tried, after you've they lived tried there at one your point whole life. I mean, it would make some honest. sense, of yeah. course, in a... Yeah in a tight city, but it's a but hard But they can't find anything most likely as affordable. Right, exactly. Right. It's one of the problems we were talking before about the, um, the deregulation of rent-stabilized apartments. I mean, they, you know, that was another haven. You could move from Mitzalam into a big West Side apartment or a Brooklyn apartment and stay. But then if you're working and your, your wife is working or your husband's working and you're both making, what, $85,000, $80,000 a year, or no, it would have to be $90,000 right. a year. Yeah. You're over. You can. They can destabilize your apartment. Then it becomes market rate. Then right. where do you go? Well, and we've been use, We've been losing rent regulated units. Partly when people's incomes go up, but partly now when a unit gets to two thousand dollars a month in rent, when that when that household moves out, that unit is deregulated. And so what you have landlords do is look for students. You know, and they'll rent a three bedroom to three students at seven hundred dollars each. Uh, those students are gone in a year or two, and now the unit's deregulated. Uh, and so. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the when I started, uh, when so many people started in community development, we were really facing this paradigm of abandonment. The neighborhoods were abandoned, and that's the mindset we got in of renovating buildings right. to make them affordable and giving incentives to developers to build. Now we're in this sort of time of growth, you know, where we've added a million people over the last 20 years. We're projected to add another million over the next 20 or 25, and so, of course, the housing market has gone haywire. The pressures are just extraordinary. Uh, NYU, the Furman Center, released this study uh, last week, even just looking at the changes between 2002 and 2005, so a pretty short period of time. But the number of units renting between $600 and $800 went down 20%. Uh, the, the, the average amount that a, a low-income family, somebody earning less than $25,000 a year, pays for housing, if they're not lucky enough to live in a subsidized unit, went up from about 40% of their income to half their income. So those are folks who it's have terrible. just almost nothing left over, yeah. and those pressures are just being felt by people of every income uh, all throughout the I know in Brooklyn, uh, Father Powis is a friend of ours, and he works there, and he, he sometimes, when he has a case in, in housing court, he asks my husband, who used to have a familiar face in, sure. in the housing court, Absolutely. to come with him. <laughs> and he <laughs> marches Jimmy up and down the court so that the hearing officer or whatever hears it. But that, what they're doing there is just horrible. These are old houses with poor families in it. And what happens? They, they, buy, they sell the buildings. They buy, somebody buys the building. They either try to buy the people out. And to some families, $2,500 or $3,000 in cash is a, no, something they right. want. Yes, now increasingly the landlords with this as a business plan. You know, Juan Gonzalez has been writing yeah. columns about this uh, outfit called Pinnacle that now owns about 20,000 right. units in the city. And their whole business plan is to pick buildings in neighborhoods like Crown Heights in Brooklyn right. or University Bushman, Heights yeah. in the Bronx, and they, where if they can just quickly start doing some improvements and bring eviction and actions right. against everybody pretty quickly, they can just take that building out of rent regulation or certainly out of affordability. What are some of the projects you're working on now at the center? So uh, what we're working on, and it's really in many ways wonderful, is helping communities grapple with these tensions of, of growth. They're seeing, uh, in a lot of cases, it's communities that wanted some development, and now they're thinking, wow, all right, well, how do we make this work for us? So we're consulting to Community Board 9 in Manhattan and community groups around the Columbia expansion, uh, and they're really engaged in a, in a real good negotiation. They laid out their own plan for the community, which looks quite different from... Columbia's, although it makes a lot of room for Columbia to expand and grow. 
and now they're engaging in a real conversation. What's that neighborhood going to look like? What's the shape of it going to be? How much development? What kinds of development? And trying to negotiate with Columbia about how that development works for the neighborhood. Uh, in Queens, we're doing a, a wonderful project uh, with a, a coalition of immigrant groups, Asian Americans for Equality, Forest Hills Community House, uh, Latin American Integration Center, looking at this wonderful set of neighborhoods, parts of Sunnyside, Woodside, Elmhurst, and Jackson mm -hmm. Heights, um, all of which are more Wonderful. than half immigrant, right. but in which no one group uh, more, predominates. It, 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 there's a school there that, um, teach it, that has how many languages? Like yeah, 132 it's, it's, it's really different languages. It's really remarkable and models. vibrant, yeah. but also facing all the same yeah. pressures. There's starting to be, certainly in Jackson Heights and Sunnyside, uh, some gentrification. There's a lot of illegal housing conversions, a lot of you know new development and teardowns. And so we've, we're doing a planning project that's trying to identify, okay, where do we not want to see growth because it's undermining the fabric of the neighborhood? Where can we promote growth, but only if there's some affordable housing included? How do we build the new kinds of schools and community centers that we need? How to address these issues of illegal housing conversions? Uh, so that we do planning projects all around the city, a real range and of things. A community use, can they still originate their own planning project? And That's is right. That what, you're and doing? That's, what do you call that? That's well, the number? So, uh, 197A. A. It's okay. a section of the city charter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that gives a community board or you know a subset of a community board the ability to sort of plan for their neighborhood. Now, the problem with them is they're very labor intensive and they're only advisory. So it takes a lot of time and you don't necessarily wind up having real power. And money power. sometimes, you, or you have to look for but, bono Right, advice. that's where we come in. <laughs> uh, but when done uh, right, and uh, I really think you know we have a couple of recent examples. Then the Columbia uh, Community Board Nine example is a great one where they started doing it a while ago before they even realized that Columbia was sort of looking yeah. to expand here. And so even though their plan isn't necessarily going to be the one, it's created a real framework for those negotiations. And actually, for the first time, the Department of City Planning has agreed to have the community's plan and Columbia's plan reviewed well, that's simultaneously. And so I think there'll be some. <laughs> I think that will help make sure that some of what did the that happen wants. because you were there and Ron Schiffman is there. So Ron has been working with them, and we've been working with them. Now they're pretty forceful themselves yeah. as well. Uh, you know, yeah. it's a community board that really knows how that. And that's a neighborhood push. That where you then bring in the discussion of 421A, and you guys wrote a big report on the use of this form of tax relief for developers. That's right. Well, and this is part of trying to think about what the what these new times look like because in. In the 1970s, when no one was building in New York, kind of at the at the bottom of the fiscal crisis, the city said, "Well, you know what we'll have to do to get people to develop to develop and not just abandon properties? We'll give you a tax break. So, if you build new housing, if you construct new residential units, that's what we want. And so, you don't have to pay your taxes in Manhattan. You don't have to pay for 10 years yeah. outside of Manhattan. You don't have to pay for 15." And for a while, that was going along. Then in the 80s, uh, as even some of the rest of the neighborhoods weren't d developing, but the Manhattan housing market was really booming, uh, folks like you and others said, we've got to change this. If we're going to give away the taxes, we, ought to, and we, we shouldn't be subsidizing luxury housing. We should at least get some affordable units. So they changed the rules a bit so that in kind of midtown, between 96th Street and 14th Street or so, uh, you only get that break if you include some affordable housing. Uh, either on site or you kind of buy a certificate somewhere else. That program doesn't really work too well. But uh, but then people just left it alone. Uh, and even, you know, again, through the early 90s when there wasn't much development, no one was too up in arms about it. But in the last few years, you know, la this year alone, the city's giving up uh, more than $400 million uh, that's not being collected in, in property taxes. Uh, for a program, 80% of the benefits go to Manhattan. Only about 8% of the units have been are affordable. So it's it's fairly straightforwardly a subsidy for luxury housing that the vast majority of New Yorkers can't afford, and yet it comes, comes from, from their that, property right. taxes. What's so uh, and interesting? And we're lucky that we're I think on the cusp of getting some real reform. This with is that what's program. so interesting about it. It is such a political issue. It's and people don't understand it. That's it's confusing because right. it's taxes and developing and all of that. But it's a political issue. 420 million dollars. Is that what you said? I think it was 406. 406 year, million. Look Look at the fuss they're making about the um, uh, the anti-terrorism. What do you call it? The Homeland Security money. Right. I, right. That amazed me. The Homeland Security money to New York City was something like two hundred forty million dollars. First of all, that's a drop in the bucket, right? What can you do for two hundred forty million? Now it's been cut in half, and there are all these politicians latching on to something that's very popular, saying this is just outrageous. We need that money, but they'll send four hundred twenty million dollars, four hundred six million dollars to the real estate industry. That's now, right. let's just look at that, because 
that originated in the city council and the state, or is it just the city council? The four, uh, 421A is, is, has to have both. There's the state authorizing legislation and then the city council right. kind of. And then we have along with it 8020. Right. And that means that 20% of your housing is for, for affordable housing income. and low income and 80%, so you get another tax. And so you can combine them, can't you? Uh, you can, can you? You know, it's a little, you can I combine some things, but not others. Yeah. So, yes, you can use the 421A. You get some tax credits and some tax exempt bonds. And, you know, uh, sometimes it works. Certainly, it is true that there are some units in Manhattan that are affordable because of that program. Yeah. But, you know, I, I was uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, I was at Hudson Guild in Chelsea, yeah. and we were having a dialogue about, uh, about Chelsea and what makes it a, uh, continue to be a diverse neighborhood. And what makes Chelsea continue to be a diverse neighborhood is public housing and Penn South, a, a yeah. Mitchell Lama like development, not the 8020s or the little, you know, I mean, that Pure. was a real commitment to yeah. carving out space, in the one case for middle income people, in the other case, low income people. Uh, because otherwise the market rolls over. So now I'm, I'm enthusiastic about the changes I think we'll make to the 421A program. And actually we've also been working on this uh, tool called inclusionary zoning that says as you're redeveloping a neighborhood, and it's a little different from the version of the program that was, that's been in Manhattan for a long time. Uh, so in Greenpoint Williamsburg on the waterfront, actually, there was a wonderful mm. announcement yesterday that the first development's going forward. And basically, the developers can build, you know, so big if they build all market rate and get no tax credit. Or they can build, you know, a third again bigger and get a 15-year tax benefit if they include 20 or 25 percent affordable housing. And so yesterday, Within that they, neighborhood or uh, in, in that, that building? case, uh, thanks to the, to the <laughs> strong work of Assemblyman Vito Lopez, who really <laughs> wanted on the Greenpoint Williamsburg waterfront, the affordable units to be on the waterfront too. And so in that set of developments, yes, and not necessarily in the same building. What they're doing yesterday, they, they broke ground, I think, on a, you know, 300 unit condo tower and then a 120 unit kind of mid-rise building. Yeah. But that really you're not is gonna deeply affordable. You're not going to tell me that Vito's part has, has it and the other part doesn't have it? Uh, is that what you're going to say? Well, he fought <laughs> especially hard to make sure that on the waterfront in Greenpoint and Williamsburg, yeah. the affordable units have to be right there on the site. Uh, some of the other programs let them be somewhere else in the neighborhood, <laughs> a half mile it. away. <laughs> and he would not allow it. And it was part of, you know, there was a big, you know, political yeah. argument at the end. And But, you know, that, that was a development that when it was initially proposed, uh, included no affordable housing. It was going to be something like 10,000 units of housing along the waterfront, new high rises, a lot of new development upland, conversion from manufacturing to residential, so also taking away blue collar jobs. And there were no provisions for affordable housing. They said, oh, well, people will will choose to come to the city and ask us for subsidies to build affordable housing <laughs> when they could be selling their condos for a yeah. million dollars plus. But the community organized, the elected officials were supportive. Uh, and w between these two tools, the well, they really did a, a few things. They used these zoning incentives, they used tax incentives, and they used every scrap of city-owned property they could find. Uh, to come up with a plan that make will make that should make about a third of the housing that gets developed oh, there good. over the next 20 yeah. years uh, affordable. Now that doesn't do enough to help folks living in the neighborhood now who are seeing their rent regulated rents rise and and feeling a lot of <laughs> displacement pressure. But it does say if when we're going to create a new neighborhood, when we're going to promote development, we are going to do as much as we possibly can to make sure that a piece of so we need is affordable. Th there, there's no master plan. The last master plan was done when? Uh, during the Lindsay administration. They're working on one now. Are they? Uh, and we'll have to see what it, what it looks like. It's very interesting because uh, Deputy Mayor Dr. Off, uh, the mayor announced in his state of the city that they were working on a sort of strategic plan. And certainly a number of us have have, have complained over the last few years that we have sort of a case of project-itis uh, right. in, in New York City, that there have been a lot of these development projects and rezonings, and but without looking at the bigger picture of, you know, what does that mean for where people can live and what the transportation is and what the infrastructure can support and where are we going to put the power plants and the... Um, and so now they said they're going to go ahead and do it. Now, it's interesting because in general this has actually been a pretty... Uh, consultative administration. Now, the 421A is a good example. We, we have a whole task force that I was uh, honored to be asked to serve on to propose reform to the program. A lot of uh, there's this poverty commission they've set up, but the master plan is being done by Wait, them. Did the 421A uh, come out of Doctora? Uh, well, the the housing yeah. commissioner, yeah. Sean Donovan, yeah. who works okay. for the deputy mayor. Um, 
So, but on the strategic plan, they they haven't really talked to anyone about it. On the other hand, I'm not sure. They've already got their development plate pretty well full up through the end of the yeah. Bloomberg administration. And so I think this will jumpstart a conversation uh, if, if we're going to add out. a million people to New York City as the demographers say over the next 20 or 25 years. That's the equivalent of adding the, uh, the, the full population of Miami and Boston into the five boroughs, you know, in the next two or three yeah. decades. And so how do we do that? I mean, you've got and these... And just keep this, as you said, a sustainable... That's right. And you really see... It's going to be... A yeah, I mean, you know, there's yeah. a real tension. There's so many places yeah. in the city where people feel like development is undermining their quality of life and are pushing and saying, we don't want any more development, but we can't both. And it's grow also by. undermining their ability, their financial ability to live there. There's no doubt about that. The more development, and no matter how what we do about affordable housing, it still has the domino effect, doesn't That's it? That's right. I mean, I mean just in a city ripples, where two thirds of the folks are renters, and so right. they don't see any benefit from increases right. in property values. Right. Uh, you know, it's the study that I mentioned that just came out yeah. from of NYU, uh, just between 2002 and 2005, uh, rents went up about 8% 8, 8 and average tenant incomes went down 6%. 6 so, so, yeah. And as we age, and well, I don't know if the, if the population increases, the age goes down. I don't know what happens. Uh, I mean, we are an aging. We are. I mean, most of the growth is from immigration. And they're uh, young. And so those tend to I be I watch the families. parade. I watch their demonstrations. They're young and vital and very exciting, actually. Um, Nehemiah Houses, do you work with them? Uh, we do a little work with the Industrial Areas Foundation yeah. and some of the groups that created it. Um, uh, I think and this is something that actually uh, Ron Schiff and my predecessor yeah. really pushed on. I mean, unfortunately... Uh, and I think he was the only one, one of the only people 20 years ago visionary enough to see it, that we would come to regret building at such low densities in neighborhoods that had yeah. had higher densities before. Obviously, giving you know, uh, people homeownership opportunity yeah. is a wonderful thing to do, and that's a great organization that's created uh, real community and, and given those communities power and created opportunity. At the same time, what we're learning is that what we need in New York is in some ways what makes so many of the neighborhoods great, a mix of... Uh, uses and types and some high density, uh, you know, apartment buildings and some low rise buildings. And we're and, not going to. And a community. I mean, I, I, I know that they're wonderful because they give people homes. There's no doubt about that. But you drive through sections of Brooklyn where, where there are a lot of these different developments. Yeah. There's no planning. I mean, they're different right. styles. They're not, they don't complement each other. They're, I remember That's no right. trees. That's I mean, right. it's ugly. That's right. It's and, you know, ugly. you make and people get in their cars because yeah. if you don't build it enough density right. that the commercial they have to strips move, can't right. you support can't do the it. things you need so to get. So how do we do that? Are, can we make a, uh, a can, I mean, how do you get planning? That, well, the planning would, in, one area would inject I will that. give city planning actually a little bit of credit. Uh, one thing they've been doing in some neighborhoods, not enough neighborhoods, but some neighborhoods, is saying, all right, you know, you're feeling too much, a, a lot of development pressure here, and you say you don't want more development because right. on Row House and Brownstone Side Streets, people are tearing down buildings and building stuff that's out of scale. We're going to look at this neighborhood, and on side streets, with a built form is, you know, a two or a three family or a four story building, we'll cap the height there so that development doesn't take place. But then we need to find commercial yeah, avenues. avenues and sites near transit and, you know, uh, other kinds of, you know, if you're going to convert a manufacturing area, do it in a way where you where you include the infrastructure and where you build at but some it, density. And uh, yeah, it's important. And that was done, though, wasn't it? Because they were able to locate some space here and they got some space here, right? There wasn't, I mean, it's not only the lack of planning on, on the develop, on the Nehemiah people, but on the city people right. because nobody in Right. And I mean, at the it. time, to be fair, it was hard to imagine that you were the city anything. would be growing again, yeah. that there would be development. I mean, obviously, there was enormous yeah. pressure to... I mean, there's this whole idea of planned shrinkage, yeah. which was to just let those neighborhoods go. And, you know, it is to the credit of people. And this is where the kind of community development perspective comes back in. And you really exactly. do need a balance because, on the one hand, you need folks in the neighborhood who have a vision for the kind of place they want to live, who do the work, who did the work in that case to bring it back. You know, but then you do need somebody thinking more about the regional economy and growth and how you're going to make sure that the transit infrastructure is strong. Um, you know, this is one of there was you know whole, this whole dialogue uh, when when Jane Jacobs dies. And, you know, Jane Jacobs and James Galbraith died in yeah. about the same kind of two right. week span of time. Seems... And obviously, she got so much right about uh, what neighborhoods need. But there certainly is another piece about what that makes those neighborhoods possible. Because without the subway system, you there's no go. West Village. Right. Uh, and so, 
you know, how you balance between the kind of big picture infrastructure regional needs and mm -hmm. the real on the ground. And there's certainly no way of needs. integrating a neighborhood if you haven't got the transportation. I mean, isn't that an old trick of people who really want to protect the the balance, the ethnic balance in their neighborhoods. We're almost yes, finished. Sir. We didn't, I mean, we, we started to talk about the real, you know, this, the political thing about 421A, and you have to come back because we have to talk about the <laughs> influence. I mean, how people, <laughs> you know, how, I, I mean, who's where? When, when, when the destabilization of apartments came of the 2000, who was the chief of staff at the city council but Joe Strasberg? That's right. Now Joe Strasberg is the head of the rent stabilization. Well, so he's in his day job, he's paid as the head lobbyist of the Rent Stabilization Association <laughs> Which to try to get rid of the rent laws. Right. They represent building owners and landlords and they try to remove the rent laws. He then has a <laughs> uh, volunteer appointment as the chair of the board of Sony May, the state of New York Mortgage Association, in which, on behalf of Governor Pataki, he regulates and sets the climate for what else but building owners. Right. Uh, and, you know, what we found, we just released a report looking at the Pataki administration housing policy. And, you know, it's either bad or worse, right? Bad is total neglect of need, cutting funds, uh, you know, undermining rent regulations. And worse is rewarding campaign contributors well, that's what I was gonna uh, say. with hundreds and who's of millions the base, of dollars. Where does Pataki get the money to run? And now, where does he get the money to go to Iowa? That's right. But from the real estate that's industry, right. and it's, that's right. You know, I mean, it's it's the it's developers who then get state tax exempt bonds. It's landlords and building owners who then have the who were able to undermine the rent laws. It's even adult home operators, right? Who there was this right. enormous right. scandal of abuse of of seniors in the adult homes, where their lobbyist uh, was kind yeah. of then hired to regulate the thing. industry. So. Uh, hopefully, you know, the next governor will do something to try to restore the legacy of Mitchell Lama and New York yeah. State's real affordable I housing I hate to programs. tell you this, but um, we've finished our half hour, mm -hmm. and it's such a joy to meet someone who so thoroughly enjoys what they're <laughs> doing. I just think you're a picture of wellness and happiness oh, and, and effectiveness, so I'm pleased, and I think people are lucky to have you where you are, and lots of good luck. Oh, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.